The Bible reading today comes from Hebrews uh, chapter 4 verse 14 to chapter 5 verse 10. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of God, throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters relating to God, to other gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and, are, and have gone astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honour on himself, but he receives it when called by, by called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because, he, because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation. For all who obey him, and he was, he, was, he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Well, hello and welcome back to our series in Hebrews. I want to start by asking you a question. Why am I not a priest? Uh, my role here is lead pastor, and this is very common in the Baptist church. We, we generally have pastors, not priests. So why the difference? Well, maybe it's just it's just semantics. Maybe priest kind of sounds a bit fancy uh, and pastor's a bit more kind of down to earth. Maybe it's just a church jargon issue, um, which can kind of catch people out who don't often attend church. I remember my previous church, sometimes someone would come to the office and ask, are you the priest? Can I please speak to a priest? Uh, which can be sometimes a little awkward when we have to say, look, there's actually no priest in this church, but it's probably me you want to speak to. But should we be priests? Should I be a priest? Our Anglican and, and Catholic friends, they have priests. I went to college and the theological college I studied at uh, had many people who are now priests. Are we missing out on something that we have pastors and not priests? This is essentially our question for today. Do we need a priest? Do you need a priest? Well, as I mentioned, we're back in Hebrews today. And for six weeks, we worked through part one of Hebrews, which we titled Jesus, the Son of God. Today is our first message in part two, another six-week block in the middle of Hebrews, which we've called Jesus Replaces the Religious System. Hebrews is a book in the New Testament part of our Bibles, probably written in the 60s AD by an unknown author. And it was written to a group of Jewish background Christians who were living outside of Israel, possibly even in Rome. And it was written to show these Christians the centrality and importance of Jesus in what God has done. And the title for today's message is Jesus, the only priest we need. And we get this from the very first verse, chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Before we go and consider how Jesus might be our high priest, let's take a step back and ask, what is a priest? What is a priest? 
Well, also in today's reading, chapter 5, verses 1 to 4, we have a very neat little description of an Old Testament Jewish priest. It says, Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weaknesses. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honour on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. Just from these verses, we learn three big things about Old Testament Jewish priests. Firstly, in verses 1 and 4, we see a priest is chosen by God from the people. So a priest had to be from the people. They couldn't be an outsider. They had to be a real member of the people, but they weren't elected to their role or they didn't win it or, or, by, or, or earn it by skill or education. No, they were chosen by God. And this is really important that the, the whole priesthood, in fact, was a gift of God to his people. It wasn't a human invention or idea. It was actually part of the Old Testament law given from God. And God also provided the priests needed to help his people maintain fellowship and worship God rightly. Priests were from the people chosen by God. Secondly, also from verse 1, we read that a priest is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God and to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And this is really the heart of what a priest means. They represent the people before God. The priest kind of stands in the gap between a sinful people and a holy God. In Jewish culture, the the priest did this primarily by offering sacrifices, mainly animal sacrifices, for people's sins, so that God would look upon the animal sacrifice and hold off his punishment for his guilty people. And it's interesting, this element of priesthood is actually present in many tribal and animistic religious cultures. So in many of these religions, there is a sense of the holiness of of God or of gods, the sinfulness or weakness of ordinary people and the need for someone or something to bridge the gap, which is why in many tribal cultures, the the religious holy man or woman is often also called a priest. And I want to suggest this felt need for a mediator is kind of a deep spiritual truth. Now, The sad part of this is that in many cases, this leads to all sorts of mistaken worship, uh, including at its worst, human sacrifice. But that concept, that idea of humans needing a mediator is deeply spiritual, even if the application can often be horrific. We also see in this the difference, I think, between a pastor and a priest that I mentioned earlier. See, the word pastor means something like shepherd. Pastor and and pasture are similar. A pastor is one who takes care of people like a shepherd takes care of the sheep, of the flock. But a priest is a mediator. They're the one who stands between the people and God. A priest actually has some kind of access to God that others do not. So why am I a pastor and not a priest? Well, one reason is as Baptists, we hold to the Reformation doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, which means that all believers, all people with faith in Jesus have equal access to God. So I'm a pastor, not a priest. I don't have special access to God that you don't. Uh, And it's worth noting as well, the priesthood of all believers doesn't mean churches are to have no leaders. It just means in Jesus, we all have the same access to God. We all have equal access to God. Thirdly, from this passage, we learn that a priest is able to empathise with sinful people. So from chapter 5, verses 2 to 3, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. This passage reminds us, priests are sinful. Uh, One great example of this is Zechariah, the, the father of John the Baptist. He was a priest in the temple. And he was a good man, a godly man, but not perfect. He was also a sinner. 
And we actually have a record of this, don't we? When an angel came to Zechariah and told him about his upcoming son, the birth of John the Baptist, he distrusted the word of the Lord. And so God actually made him mute for nine months for the period of the pregnancy. Now, human priests being sinful kind of has an advantage and a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that they need to offer sacrifices for their own sin as well. The advantage is that they do have a certain solidarity with sinful people, an understanding of human weakness. So when someone comes to a priest in confession and says, priest, I need a sacrifice for this thing I did, I I realise now it was foolish, the priest wouldn't say, you know, you idiot, what were you thinking? What a classic rookie mistake, you know, go home. No, the priest would think to themselves, you know what, I've done something similar myself. Come on, let's do this together. Let's get you right before God. Or as the passage says, they can deal gently with sinners as they are also subject to weakness. So there's an Old Testament Jewish priest. They're chosen by God from the people. They represent the people before God. They offer gifts and sacrifices. And they're also sinful, which means they do have to offer sacrifices for themselves and they can empathise with those they're helping. I was trying to think of a helpful analogy for priesthood in our world, because it's a bit of a strange concept, that concept of a mediator or go-between. One example I came up with was that of a classroom of students, many of whom have done something wrong and have maybe a terrible reputation as well for doing the wrong thing. Maybe they've allowed wild animals to kind of destroy the classroom or they've let a virus onto the whole school's computer system or something. And instead of fronting up to the teacher themselves to confess what they've done, they send the most well-regarded student to the teacher to kind of plead their case. Now, this good student is not perfect, and they'll also have to own up to their own part in you know, the, the wild animal scheme or whatever it was. And their own imperfection means they don't kind of just scoff at the other students when they approach him and say, no, they know what it is to mess up, to make mistakes. But they do have a good track record with this teacher. In, in fact, they're the teacher's chosen representative on the student council. So they're chosen by the students to kind of mediate this mess. So they go before the teacher cap in hand, offering some kind of gift or sacrifice on behalf of the students. Maybe, you know, the students will clean the classroom after class for the whole week or they'll do extra homework or something. Now, this analogy is not perfect, as with all analogies, but maybe it gives you a bit of a hint of what that role of a priest is like, the one who comes between sinful humans and a holy God. Before we move on, I also want to note here, the author of Hebrews does not trash this Old Testament priestly system, does he? Much like in Hebrews 1, when he wrote about, you know, God's revelation in the Old Testament, or when he wrote about angels, or or when he wrote about Moses, the author of Hebrews, you can tell he loves the Old Testament. And this here is a very fair, relatively positive description of Old Testament priesthood. It's a system that worked to keep people in relationship with God. There's no suggestion that it was wrong or defective. But as with Old Testament revelation, as with angels, as with Moses, the Old Testament priesthood points to something greater. It points to Jesus. Let me read again, chapter 4, verse 14, first verse from today's reading. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Jesus is described as our great high priest. And the author considers those same three things we've just seen about human priests to show how Jesus is actually both similar and different from other priests. So firstly, like all priests, Jesus was chosen by God from among the people. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 to 6, we read, In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father. And in another place, you are a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. So the author of Hebrews here is quoting from two Psalms, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. And both these Psalms are messianic. That is, they refer to a king of Israel in the time it was written. But they also point beyond that to God's ultimate final king, the Messiah, who is Jesus. 
And these psalms confirm that God is committed to his king, uh, who is called the Son of God, and that this king is also a priest. Now, the reference to Melchizedek is a little strange, but in, I think, two weeks' time, we'll look more into Melchizedek. So I'm going to kind of hold on that for now. I won't steal any thunder from two weeks' time. The big point we have here is that God the Father appointed his son, King Jesus, to be a priest, just like Old Testament priests were appointed by God. Okay, so Jesus is chosen by God. Does he come from the people? Well, in a sense, no, because we know that Jesus comes from heaven. He's God in human flesh. And yet that's kind of the point. He is in human flesh. In Hebrews chapter 2, we saw the importance of Jesus being human so that he could properly mediate between God and humanity. Jesus had to be human to be an effective priest. He, he had to be kind of from the people. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human, in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Let's use our crude kind of school student analogy again. Basically, only a student can represent other students in front of the teacher. It would make no good if it was a parent or someone else from outside the school. So Jesus is chosen by God and comes from the people. Secondly, like all priests, Jesus represents the people to God and offers gifts and sacrifices for sins. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 8, we read, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. The reference here to prayers and petitions with cries and tears could really refer to lots of things in Jesus' life, but probably points particularly to the Garden of Gethsemane. And of course, the greatest offering that Jesus made, the greatest gift and sacrifice he made as a priest for humans towards God was his own life. And our, our school student analogy definitely breaks down at this point. It would be as if that you know, mediating student offered something so significant to the teacher that all past and future misdemeanors by any student could be covered by this one amazing gift. Jesus offered his own life as a sacrifice. It's an incredible reality that Jesus is both the priest and the gift or sacrifice offered by the priest to God. Now, this will also be focused on in a later message, but just for now, we read just as a passing line, verse 8, Jesus suffered. He suffered on the cross for our sake, in our place, offering himself as the ultimate sacrifice and by this becoming the ultimate high priest. And finally, of course, a moment ago, we learnt that priests can empathise with sinners because they are themselves subject to weakness and sin. And it's here that Jesus is a different sort of priest because Jesus did not sin, not once. Jesus always perfectly obeyed God. He always acted out of love for his heavenly Father and out of love for others. He always guarded his thoughts, his words and his deeds and kept them in conformity to God's will. Jesus did not sin. And yet we read that he was still in a way able to empathise with us. Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. See, while Jesus did not sin, we're reminded he was tempted. He understands what temptation means. One commentator, David Peterson, goes further and actually suggests that Jesus felt temptation more than we do because he never gave in to it. See, the temptation was never kind of resolved by giving in, you know, whereas we often will just give in to temptation, perhaps disobey God, and then the temptation's gone. Peterson writes, Indeed, only he who resisted temptation to the end knows its full weight. Now, again, our school student analogy will slide here. The representative would have to be the perfect student, but also one who is kind of more tempted than anyone else. 
who knew how easy it was for other students to give in and so went to the teacher willingly, knowing the weight of temptation, although never succumbing himself. The important thing here is Jesus never had to offer sacrifices for his own sin, like like other priests, because he never did sin. He was never his own priest. He was only ever priest for others. Which means Jesus' sacrifice finishes the job. Jesus never needed to come come back again to offer another sacrifice, as a human priest would, because of their own sinfulness. But Jesus' sacrifice is described as once for all, a sacrifice that finishes the job. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 9 to 10, we see it's described as the source of eternal salvation. I'll read that again. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Well, let's go back to our original question. Do you need a priest? Do you need a priest? Do you need someone to mediate your relationship with God? The answer is yes. You need a priest. I need a priest. I need a priest because I'm sinful and God is holy. I disobey God, sometimes intentionally, sometimes recklessly. I often live for myself rather than for God or for others. And you see, if a sinful being like myself was presented directly before a holy God, well, I would be consumed by the holiness and justice of God. I need someone to stand in that gap. I need a mediator. I need a priest. And I suspect when you're most honest with yourself, you know this is true for you as well, that you don't always live for God, not totally, that you often are sinful, that you often live for yourselves. You know you need someone to stand in that gap. You need a priest. The good news of the Bible is we have such a priest in Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, who lived a perfect life and then died in our place for our sake, offering the greatest gift and sacrifice possible. In fact, he offered the only gift and sacrifice necessary to bridge the gap between us and God so that we can stand before God and and not be consumed. In fact, we can stand before God and incredibly be called God's children. And Jesus actually continues his priestly work for us today, not offering more sacrifices, but interceding, praying for us at God's right hand. We read in Romans 8.34, Jesus Christ who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Hopefully it's clear to you now why we have pastors and not priests in our church. Partly it's because we uphold the priesthood of all believers that all of us have equal access to God. But I think even more so, it's because Jesus is the only priest that we need. He's the only priest who stands between us and God the Father, shielding us by his sacrifice, so that we, sinful though we are, can stand before our holy God. We need a priest, and we have the only priest we need in Jesus Christ. Well, how do we respond to this? Well, the passage itself actually has two great encouragements for us. From chapter 4, verse 14, our first verse, we're encouraged to hold firmly to our faith. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. How does Jesus being our high priest lead us to holding firmly to our faith? Well, it's because our faith is in Jesus himself. Our faith is in this priest, the very one who died on our behalf for our sake and who is now at God's right hand. This makes sense, doesn't it? Because Jesus is the only priest we need. See, there's not much point holding firmly to, to anything else, not much point holding firmly to you know, our human efforts to please God, our kind of sham sort of self-works righteousness religion. No, the, the only thing to hold firmly to is faith in Jesus. He's the only one who can bridge that gap between us and God the Father. What does this look like today? Well, I think it looks like reminding ourselves regularly of what Jesus has done for us, daily acknowledging our dependence on Jesus before God and thanking Jesus for his sacrifice for us. 
We'll do this in a moment as we pray. The second encouragement is in chapter 4, verse 16, to approach God confidently. It says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. This makes sense, I think, doesn't it? We can come before God humbly, but also confidently. Not confident in our own righteousness or holiness, but confident in Jesus Christ, who stands between us and for us to God the Father. We can be confident that through Jesus, as it says, we can receive mercy and grace. What a great encouragement for us to pray boldly, to approach God boldly, all because we know Jesus stands for us. And I actually think together these two encouragements give us that great combination of humility and confidence. Humility because we we know we never stand before God on our own, but only because Jesus is our priest. And confidence because with Jesus as our priest, we do have great access to God the Father. Well, let me pray now. Let me pray and thank God for Jesus, our high priest, and celebrate the access we have to God through him. Will you join me? Lord God, we acknowledge today that we cannot stand before you on our own. Lord, we confess that we do not love you with our whole heart. We do not love our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, we are sorry. We are sorry for our sin and wayward hearts. And yet, Lord, we are so grateful that you sent Jesus for us. Lord, as our sacrifice, as our saviour, and also, Lord, as our priest, as the one who can mediate our relationship with you. Thank you for what Jesus has done for us on the cross, offering as a priest a sacrifice of his own life for our sake. Lord, I pray that you would help us to hold firmly to this truth and hold firmly to Jesus. And Lord, help us never to start to believe that we can stand before you without Jesus as our priest. And Lord, we thank you and celebrate today the access that we have to you through Jesus. Lord, that even as we pray today that we know you hear us because Jesus is our priest. Lord, thank you that we can approach you boldly, not in our own righteousness, but because of what Jesus has done for us. Thank you, Lord God, that Jesus is our high priest. Amen.